Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% a real Jesus. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, the Health, Medicine, and Bioscience Edition. Uh, today, my guest is from Johns Hopkins University. It's Svetlana Lutsenko. She's a professor there. We're going to be talking about uh, the mechanisms behind human disorders and various aspects there. So, Svetlana, thanks for coming. How are you doing? So, my pleasure. I'm doing just fine. So, tell me about your research. Um, I have like a generic description, but I'm sure you can give it more life. What are you working on? So we're very interested in human disorders associated with copper metabolism. And copper is extremely important ion, so it requires for respiration, for production of um, very important neurotransmitters and neuromodulators. So it's very important for regulation of fat balance and immune response. It plays very important roles in human body. And uh, when there is a, um, conditions of copper misbalance, and these are usually um, genetic disorders. So under these circumstances, uh, so uh, we have either copper deficiency, uh, and severe copper deficiency is uh, observed in Menke's disease, or copper overload, and this is what is seen in uh, Wilson disease. And these are very severe disorders. In fact, Menke's disease is a fatal disorder. So the kids who are um, born with this disease, they die invariably. And Wilson disease uh, is also uh, has to be treated. Uh, and um, if it's not treated, it also can be fatal. So copper balance is really so. And in my lab, so we're trying to understand how we get copper, how we process copper, what happens with copper normally, how it's utilized for all these different processes, and what happens in it. Where does, uh, I guess, copper we would probably need just by my guess is in very small amounts. Is that true? And where do we get it from in our diet? So we need very little copper. So we need every day maybe one to two milligrams. So in a normal healthy diet, we get uh, plenty of copper. So it's sufficient. So it's um, very abundant in spinach. It's uh, present in nuts and chocolate and obviously in meat and liver. Um, and uh, the, normally the conditions of copper deficiency are rare. However, in pregnancy or if diet is really very poor and unbalanced, so that's where one can get um, some mild copper. Is it, does it show up on a blood test? Is it even tested for? Like how would someone know they have a problem? So um, these days, so it's it being tested more and more because uh, there are um, conditions of copper deficiency, which have been now reported, which we still don't understand the origin of. And um, copper usually um, can be measured in, in the blood if a specific test is um, ordered. Uh, but in the standard panel, uh, we usually don't look for copper. So but it can be measured. So why is copper important to you? Why not manganese or selenium or other nutrients? So I'll just give you some examples. So we all know about mitochondria and mitochondria is essential for respiration and for production of energy. And the, one of the central uh, proteins in the mitochondria, which does this job, is the copper-containing protein. And without copper, this protein, which goes... Um, uh, cytochrome C oxidase, it does not work. So copper is absolutely essential for respiration and production of uh, um, energy in cell. So the other important protein, which again, you know, many people know because it's involved in production of catecholamines, so balance of catecholamines. So it's enzyme called dopamine beta hydroxylase, so it makes norepinephrine. And norepinephrine is very important neuromodulator, which is responsible for stress response, for attention, for uh, arousal, so many, many regulates many, many function. And in order to make uh, this particular um, hormone, the neuromodulator. So we really do need uh, activity of copper-containing enzyme. 
So again, without kappa, this protein doesn't work and one does not produce sufficient amount of norepinephrine. Uh, pigmentation. So if you look at the color of our skin, the color of uh, our um, uh, hair, eyes, so pigmentation depends on the activity of kappa-dependent enzymes. So the individuals who are severely kappa-deficient, so they actually uh, have very pale skin, very pale uh, color of the hair, sometimes that they just look like albani, albanis. So in, in the case of um, connective tissue, so the protein which is important for making the connective tissue, for, which making our um, skin elastic, the one which makes cell blood vessels elastic, it's called lysyl oxidase. So this is again copper requiring protein, so copper requiring enzyme. So if no copper, it doesn't work, so the skin and uh, blood vessels become um, uh, brittle, so the blood vessels actually twisted, so they're very abnormal. And again, this is very um, severe uh, consequences. So this is all happens when there is very little uh, of copper in, in the body, and this is normally is not caused by the deficiency in the diet, but genetic diseases, genetic abnormalities. Yeah, I didn't, <clears throat> I didn't realize it was so important. So what are you trying to figure out through your research? So what we, so we, just like I said, so what we're really interested in, so we, we're interested in how copper is uh, distributed within a cell because, um, uh, you know, as I mentioned, so there is this, all these various proteins which need copper and um, we're trying to, and all these different proteins are located in different places in the cell and they also um, get more abundant or less abundant as the uh, certain tissue develop during development and maturation of tissue. So we're trying to understand how cells and tissue, how do they know when they need more copper, how to distribute copper properly to make sure that all these enzymes and all these activities are coordinated and work properly. So we're also very interested in human uh, disorders because, as I mentioned, so the copper deficiency disease is very um, severe disease. So, but also copper overload, um, it's also genetic disease. And uh, even though the treatment is available, so there are the drugs which help to um, remove copper from the body. So the disease um, is very intriguing and very mysterious and very little is understood. So and drugs sometimes work and sometimes they don't. So we try to understand the disease mechanism better. For example, in Wilson disease, so this is disease of copper overload, um, so the, same, uh, the same mutation may cause very different uh, symptoms. So some people with uh, mutation in this gene can have a liver disease and others with exactly the same mutation can have neurological or even psychiatric problems. So we're trying to understand how is that uh, the same change in one gene can produce such very different phenotypes. In fact, actually, even the same in individuals in the same family may have different uh, uh, time of disease onset. Uh, and again, we're trying to uh, understand how um, that may happen. And what we're finding is that copper is very important for um, processing of uh, dietary fat so in overall lipid metabolism. So we see that when there are changes in copper balance that uh, affect in a very significant way how um, dietary fat is processed and how it's distributed. So we think the changes, the dietary changes can actually either uh, help to delay the disease or uh, actually make the disease worse. So that's one of the aspects of our research. We're also very interested in trying to understand how uh, why when there is a copper misbalance, so there is significant impact on uh, brain function. And so how uh, this copper changes, how changes in copper distribution and delivery to all these different um, places in the cells and different parts uh, uh, in the central nervous system, how they affect uh, brain development and brain function. So that's one of the ongoing research um, topics right now. Of the, um, <clears throat> the genes that are affected in these conditions where people have too much or too little copper, do those genes um, tend to get a lot of um, regulation? You know, do they get epigenetic marks that up or down regulate them or are they so this frequently is used? Like what, what could you tell so this is an excellent question. So so there are um, two trans so this what these proteins do, these genes. So they encode proteins which transport copper. 
And the protein which is involved in transporting copper from the gut into the bloodstream, it's called ATP7A, and that's the one which is mutated in uh, Menke's disease. And because it is mutated uh, and, and it's not uh, working properly in the gut, so there is this um, massive deficiency in the rest of the uh, body, in, uh, in, in, uh, of copper in the body. So, but the, um, this changes in, um, in the, this proteins are regulated in a very interesting way. So ATP7A is normally located within the cells in a compartment called Transgolgi. So, and that's where it takes copper and transport it within this compartment to give copper to copper dependent enzymes. The one I described already, like dopamine beta hydroxylate. So that's how these proteins get the copper from the transporter. So, but they, it, regulated in an interesting way because when copper concentration in a cell gets higher, so the transporter now move from uh, this Golgi compartment and goes to the cell um, plasma membrane, so to export excess copper from the cell. And when the copper concentration is cell getting uh, lower, so it returns back so it can continue this um, uh, function within the cell in activating um, copper requiring protein. So it basically, the transporter has a two roles. So it works for uh, uh, activation of proteins, but it also um, expert excess of copper in the cell. And ATP7B is very similar and regulated in a similar way. Uh, but it does its job mostly in the liver in some specialized uh, cells in the brain. So these two transporters, even though they're very similar uh, and do very similar jobs, so they have um, different functions because they're located in different uh, tissues. And even when they're expressed in the same cells, so they have slightly different. So do we understand where in our cells the copper will tend to reside and where it's used? Is it used in the mitochondria? But you know, when it enters, does it go to uh, somewhere else first? So it's very interesting. So when when we're born, and humans or animals, so we have um, copper storage pools. So, and we don't know exactly what, how they form, but if we use, so we can visualize copper in tissue using X-ray fluorescence. So we can take um, tissue samples. We actually go to the synchrotron and use X-ray fluorescence to, to visualize copper. So, and there is separate, in, in the liver and uh, in the brain, there is specialized compartments which store very high amount of copper. In fact, when we look at, um, uh, for example, in the liver sections or in a, uh, in a brain section, we see these um, certain cells with these copper pools, they're just glowing. And it's interesting that often these um, uh, copper storage pools are located within uh, in cells uh, in proximity to stem cells. So we think they're used when other cells developed and, uh, and mature. Uh, so this, it's very convenient to have this copper supplies nearby. So, the, you know, the body does not rely on, you know, copper efflux or copper uptake. So they can use the cells with this, um, uh, which are storing copper for, the, for, uh, for future development and proliferation. So there are particular cell types that store copper? Yes, so so for example, so we know that in, in the liver, so the, these hepatocytes actually have a, uh, when, when they are uh, early in, develop, in liver development, so they store copper. And as the liver mature, so these stores are being used. And then, you know, liver, the adult liver no longer has this ma- massive stores. So in, in, in intestine, Uh, Intestine is very interesting because intestine, um, um, the lining of intestine, the epithelial layer is changing frequently. So so there is a need for copper stores. And within the so-called crypt uh, um, region of intestine where stem cells are located, so the panis cells, which are next to stem cells, so they have these copper stores. Um, And in the brain, again, so there are specific um, uh, cells located close to neuronal stem cells. Again, so they have uh, a lot of copper, um, uh, they have high copper content, and we think they provide copper for um, uh, stem cells when they activate it. Yeah, what happens with um, people that have had copper poisoning? You know, they live near a copper mine, 
where they're a miner themselves or somehow they were, you know, overdosed on copper, but they have normal genes. Have, have they been looked at to see what uh, the effects are? So copper toxicity um, through this type of, um, you know, exposure will occur if it's, um, uh, if copper ingestions or intake, it takes time for over very long time because um, normally our body have a mechanism to deal with sudden kappa increase if it's a short term. So if it's short term, so we have a very, um, we have proteins which call metallothionines. So they are increased and these proteins bind, each protein can bind 10 to um, uh, 11 uh, kappa atoms. So they just work like kappa sponges. So, so they bind a lot of kappa, sequester it, and they bind kappa very tightly. So if there is sudden intake of copper, so this protein is just quickly upregulated. So there is uh, a lot of them and they just sequester kappa. However, if, you know, kappa keep coming, uh, so even if the transporters are working and um, these um, metallothionines are abundant, so then at a certain point, the system, this sort of, uh, which deals with copy excess, get um, 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 overloaded. And then one can see um, um, copy toxicity. And the primary copy toxicity will probably be observed, uh, again, in, in the liver and in the brain, and largely because liver is the major organ which regulate uh, copper balance. So that's where all the export of excess copper uh, occurs. So this uh, transporter, which I already mentioned, so which affected in Wilson disease protein, that's a job to take excess copper and remove excess copper uh, from the liver into the bile. So if it doesn't work, so it's Wilson disease, if it's working, but it's overwhelmed by excess of copper, so then copper start building up and that affects, as we found initially, um, lipid metabolism. It also impacts um, 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 chromatin structure uh, and cells became much more um, susceptible to uh, proliferation and they also um, because of the change in the lipid balance and overall metabolism, there is a propensity for steatosis and accumulation of fat in the liver. Is there any benefit to, um, you know, I know it's weird to ask, but is there any benefit to having these two diseases? You can't clear copper, so you have very high levels, or you have very low levels. It seems like low, there's no benefits, but is there any benefit to having an excess of copper? Well, um, I don't think excess of anything is really benefit. So what we do see, however, which is interesting, is that when we look, so when we have animals uh, on uh, a copper, high copper diet, so they absorb more fat. So, so we, need, we still need to uh, absorb more fat in the intestine, but they release less uh, fat into the circulation. So in other words, if we have um, more copper in the diet, so the animals are actually overall have less fat in their body. So that could be beneficial, so, but we still need to understand better how it works because um, right now we don't know what could be other unintended consequences. Is uh, <clears throat> copper at all implicated in obesity or do you not study that? So we did look at the Obesity. So we had a small uh, um, uh, study where we look with our colleagues, uh, uh, with bariatric surgeons, on um, uh, whether or not there is a changes in copper balance in obese individuals. And what we found is that there is very um, strong correlation between um, amount of copper in the blood and uh, uh, body mass index. In other words, so the, uh, uh, the obese individuals, so the higher their body mass, the more copper we see in the, um, in the um, serum or in the, in the blood. So we're still not entirely sure um, what causes that. So we've done some cellular studies where we can see that copper misbalance uh, produced uh, bigger and fatter um, um, adipocytes, which are fat cells. So when we see copper misbalance, we see that the, uh, these um, cells accumulate, accumulate more fat. And we identify, again, copper-dependent protein, which regulates fat uptake in, in adipocytes. And now we're trying to understand uh, why in, um, uh, in morbidly obese individuals, so there is this increase of this particular protein in overall copper in the liver. So we think that maybe 
they pl uh, play some signaling role, but this is ongoing study. Um, I guess a study could be done <clears throat> whereby if uh, you know, someone's obese or if they've had bariatric surgery, maybe uh, certain foods, if they eat or don't eat them, maybe that would modulate their copper levels and maybe modulate their weight. You know, it's, it's a good question. So it turns out that, um, so in, in bariatric surgery, so the part which is bypassed or removed is the part where there is a um, major site of copper absorption. In, in the early days of bariatric surgery, so the unintended consequences were actually uh, copper deficiency, uh, which develop over three or four years. And some of these uh, individual display neurological uh, issues associated with uh, loss of copper absorption. So I think right now there is, you know, much better awareness of, uh, of the fact that, um, you know, copper, just like uh, other uh, minerals and nutrients has to be supplemented uh, in these people. Uh, so uh, in, in some ways, uh, it's, it's hard to know how to uh, maintain uh, proper copper level when the part which is absorbing copper is removed. So, um, <clears throat> I mean, what's the implication for your research? What do you think it's going to help figure out, you know, how to help people with these diseases better manage their diseases? Or are there other things you're looking at to figure out in regards to copper? Or you just, I mean, you know, do you want to be the person that knows everything about it? What's, what's your end goal for research? Both. <laughs> so, both. So, so we, we like to know everything about copper because we think the more we know about copper, the better we can um, uh, help the individual who have copper misbalance. And just to give you one example, so I mentioned to you that already, uh, so the Wilson disease is couple, disease of copper overload. And uh, the current treatment, uh, which helps uh, many of these patients to uh, manage the disease, so it's not a cure, it's a treatment, is, to, uh, is uh, called copper chelation. So, and there is a small drug which binds copper and then removes copper from the liver. And if it's um, uh, if it's if the dose is right and the patients um, um, take the drug three times a day, um, so it actually helps and it maintains liver function and helps people to lead a very you know reasonable uh, life and for decades. However. The problem with this uh, treatment is that so disease um, has its onset in, in children. And children don't like to take um, pills three times a day. So, and also, in order for this treatment to start working, uh, it takes many, many months because this chelation therapy actually has effect. So, what physician calls in compliance is not always very good, especially in kids. So, and that leads to, um, you know, the need to develop better therapies and more efficient, effective therapy. So another side effect of this treatment is that it's sometimes it's very hard to balance um, uh, amount of uh, uh, treatment because everybody's different and everybody's accumulated uh, accumulated different amount of copper. And more importantly, liver accumulates a lot of copper, but brain accumulates much less copper. So if one gives, uh, one gives the drug which removes copper from all the organs, so then a liver can be um, normal, but brain can become copper de uh, depleted. And in fact, it's not in, uncommon in these uh, patients to see that improvement of uh, liver function, but worsening of neurological symptoms. So, and we in the lab, so we have a mouse model where we look at uh, into whether or not we can find uh, additional way to help liver function without using uh, copper chelation. So in our study, as I mentioned, so we found that what copper misbalance does, it affects uh, how uh, lipids are um, um, pro processed in, in, in the liver. And we identify protein which uh, um, regulate um, lipid uh, metabolism and which is inhibited when copper is um, high. And we were able to use the drug which stimulate this protein to show uh, that we can restore lipid uh, balance in the liver and we can significantly improve liver function and uh, overall uh, liver morphology and that even when copper is still high. So this provides us alternative way to try to improve liver um, um, 
ability liver to do its job if chelation therapy doesn't work or we can try to combine this new treatment with um, uh, with copper chelation to um, sort of have a more balanced uh, approach correcting both lipid metabolism and copper balance. So, and we're working now there, with... Uh-huh, go ahead. Oh, are, are there... No, that makes sense. Are, are there other metals or other elements or compounds that mimic copper and will bind where it's supposed to bind? Has that been observed? So zinc is very interesting because zinc doesn't really um, mimic um, uh, copper, but it, um, but it's the balancing of zinc inter- interfaces with copper balance. Let me just give you an example. So for example, so there was disorder uh, described in the Mayo Clinic a few years ago. And um, when and patients showed up with um, all, um, and all with the symptoms re- resembling in co- copper uh, deficiency. And, um, and it, 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 turned, it took them a long time to figure out that actually what was wrong with this patient, so she was uh, taking uh, zinc supplements. So she would go to Costco, got, but, you know, buy um, large, you know, bottles of zinc, which is sold, um, sold as a supplement. And she was using very large amount of the supplement, like 400 milligrams a day to maintain her zinc balance. So as a result, what she did actually, so, um, so she induced very large amount of this protein, which I already mentioned, called metallothionin, because this protein is induced um, in response to either zinc or cadmium or cobalt or copper, so it's not very specific. So, so what she did, so because she was taking zinc, so she triggered production of large amount of uh, this metallothionin in her intestine. And this, um, as I mentioned already, metallothionin binds copper very, very tightly. So she makes herself unintentionally copper depleted. So, and it took a long time for them to convince her, you know, sort of not to do that. And uh, eventually when she stopped taking this zinc, zinc supplement and get uh, and receive copper um, supplementation, so she was able to, so her neurological symptoms got improved and, you know, she got better. So there is also intersection between um, uh, copper metabolism and iron metabolism because um, um, copper is used for proteins which facilitate uh, iron um, export from cells. So in, in, in order for iron to be exported uh, from intestine and, uh, and normally delivered to other organs, so we need to have a copper-dependent protein. So in cases of copper deficiency, there is also symptoms of anemia. Well, very interesting. Well, Svetlana, I'm glad that you're looking at this. I mean, I, I don't know how many researchers are, but it's probably rare, but... Uh... What's the best way for people to find out more if they have one of these two conditions or, you know, someone they know has one, you know, for alternative therapies or to learn more about your work? It, it's, it's, it's interesting because it, it's, it's certainly true that there is, uh, so Menke's disease is very rare because it's X chromosome link, so it only affects boys. Uh, so in Wilson disease is more common, uh, but in the United States is um, the frequency maybe in um, one in 20, thousand births or 25,000 births. But it's much more common in some other countries. So for example, in, in China, it's much more common disorder. And in China, obviously, very large population. So there are quite a few people in China have Wilson disease. And it's also true in India. So in India, the disease is much more common. And in fact, in in the pediatric population of children, so the, um, uh, the liver transplant uh, uh, is the second co- uh, the second common cause the, the, of liver tra- of pediatric liver transplant in uh, in India is Wilson disease. So it depends on world population. So and um, we're learning more and more about these disorders, and actually new disorders are now being discovered. So there is so-called Mednick syndrome, which affects both um, transporters seven A and seven B, and there is uh, in the conversation with our clinicians, so I can hear that um, uh, they now come more frequently across um, some um, un- unrecognized copper deficiency or copper overload, and they still don't know the genes and proteins which are affected. So I think we will learn, learn more and we'll understand uh, um, more about this, not only about these well-characterized diseases, but in some uh, additional um, uh, 
conditions when there is a carbon balance. Well, very good. So, Atlanta, thank you for coming. I really appreciate it. Yes, my pleasure. Thank you. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.